up in infancy, we're going to be talking about psychosexual development. So the first stage in psychosexual development, according to Sigmund Freud, was, was the oral stage. And in the oral stage, what's happening here is infants are getting all their pleasure and comfort from oral stimulation. This makes sense. We just talked about the sucking reflex. And so this is the idea that through sucking, either on a pacifier or a food source or, or just sucking for comfort, it was giving them a lot of sense of, of relief. Babies will actually suck on pacifiers for emotional regulation needs. And so this type of stimulation was important. Now, Freud believed if something went wrong during this stage, it could lead to oral fixation. And in oral fixation, this is when an older child or adult would be obsessed with constantly putting things in their mouth. This might be a person who chews a lot of gum, or they chew pen caps, or they chew their nails, or maybe they smoke, or maybe they overeat. But Freud believed that this is what could cause it. And the second stage in psychosexual development, a little bit later on in the next year, it was called the anal stage. And this was called the anal stage because Freud believed this is when we start to master control over our bladder and our bowels. And so understanding how the bathroom process works. And he believed that this is a complicated thing and modern uh, potty training experts will agree it is complicated. But if a child became very anxious and very upset when they had accidents, this may preclude that person developing into what's called an anal fixation. And they may be obsessed with control and cleanliness and wanting to be extremely um, hypervigilant about everything they do. Versus if they gave up easily in this stage and they were content to defecate wherever they wanted and they weren't interested in trying to defecate in a potty, this may indicate they are going to be more deviant and rule breaking and perhaps antisocial as they get older. So if you, if you have either one of these fixations or know someone who does, uh, developmental psychology would say there is something that played out at this stage in your development. Next up, uh, we have psychosocial development with Eric Erickson. And he named two stages, and, but unlike Freud, he did not believe they had everything to do with uh, the sexuality. In the first year of life, Erickson believed this had to do with trust and mistrust. As infants cried because they were cold or lonely or hungry or wet, would their caregiver provide for them? If you had a caregiver who was responsive and reliable, this would train you to trust others. Versus if for some reason, perhaps very valid, your caregiver was sick or dealing with other very important reasons, they couldn't come to you and you, you spent a lot of time upset, this might train you that you can't trust people and that you have to be more independent. And so this would cause a trust versus mistrust conflict. In the next stage, in stage two of psychosocial development, was the stage of autonomy versus doubt. And this is the idea that as you become a toddler, you may want to try things on your own. Maybe you want to feel proud of yourself and go potty or feed yourself or dress yourself or draw pictures or make your own decisions. And it's very common to see toddlers and the terrible twos is usually a fight over autonomy and wanting to make your own decisions. And if you were allowed to give some age appropriate independence and try and feed yourself cereal or get to choose what you're going to play with, that may teach yourself that you can do it on your own. You know, practice getting dressed, practice putting your socks on is a good thing. Versus if your parents were a little bit more smothering and didn't allow you to have that and they tried to over control you or tried to fix everything for you, it may give you a sense of doubt and a sense that you can't do things on your own and you need to rely on others. And so with talking about that trust versus mistrust, that lines up nicely to talk about this other card we'll pull in infancy about attachment. So Harry Harlow was a researcher interested in understanding what attachment was all about. Was it about food or security? And he had little baby Reese's monkeys and he gave them surrogate mothers. There was lots of different experiments he had here, but in one experiment, the Reese's monkey baby was put in a cage with two potential surrogate moms. One of them was a wire monkey that just had a bottle with a nipple that would feed uh, very nutritious milk to the infant. And the other one was a wired monkey that was covered in a soft cloth that had no food. So one of them was cuddly and one of them had the food required for life. What actually happened was the rhesus monkey spent close to 23 hours a day on the cuddly monkey that didn't offer food and only went to the one with the bottle when they were hungry. They never saw the mother with the bottle as a parental figure. In fact, they often chewed its face. But they saw the one with the, t the cloth as a mother figure. And if those baby monkeys were also exposed to peers, other baby monkeys, they turned out typical. Somehow having someone to cuddle was what they needed from a mom. 
so this showed us that the attachment was really about the tactile comfort and not so much the nutrition. Now, Mary Ainsworth's work does study this attachment, but looks at how there's individual differences and how amongst humans, we all don't form the same type of attachment with our primary caregiver. And very famous uh, experiment done with this is known as the strange situation. So you don't need to know these stages in detail, but I want to run you through the experiment. It's a pretty cool one. In this, we get the primary caregiver, which is usually the mom, to take the infant to a research lab. The research lab is a room that they initially just the two of them are in, but it has all kinds of novel and interesting toys. And we're interesting to see if the baby wanders to the toys and plays, or if they hang tight to their mom, or if they move just after a certain while, or what have you. Then after they get adjusted to the room, a stranger enters. And the stranger is usually another woman and sits down in a chair and might start talking to the mom or might try to initiate play with the infant. But what we're, we're really interested here is the infant's response. Do they go up to the stranger? Do they run back to the mom when the stranger enters? Do they just kind of look at the mom and check in to see if the mom's happy or worried about the stranger? What do they do? After they get used to the stranger, the mom leaves. And this is called the first separation. We're really interested here in what the infant does. Does the infant notice that the mom leaves? Do they get a little upset? Do they get a lot upset? Do they not care? Can the stranger soothe them if they're upset? Can the stranger try and play with them or comfort them or hug them? And will that calm them down? And then the mom comes back, the stranger leaves, and this is called the first reunion. And we try to pay attention to what the infant does. If the infant was upset, does the infant calm down right away when the mom comes back? Or are they still upset for a little while? Or do they not even care when the mom comes back? Then once everything kind of goes back to baseline and the infant's okay, the mom leaves a second time. This is called the second separation. Now the infant is alone in the room. They are safe and they're being watched through a one-way mirror, but this is usually when they tend to get very upset and there's no one there to calm them. We then have the stranger enter a second time and the stranger will try and soothe them a second time. Even if the stranger could soothe them the first time, they usually cannot soothe them as well the second time. And then we finally, the last step is the second reunion where the mother returns. And again, we're looking for the infant's response if they quickly are comforted, or it takes them a while, or if they don't seem to notice. And so there tends to be some different patterns we see in this experiment. Most Canadian babies follow the trajectory that Ainsworth called secure. And this is the idea that they're using the mom as a secure base. When the mom's there, they feel safe. When the mom's not there, they don't feel safe. So when the mom leaves, they get upset. But when the mom comes back, they're happy to see her and they're comforted almost immediately. Then we have what's called the avoidant babies. These are the babies that they're just off playing with the toys. They don't notice when the mom leaves. They don't notice when the mom comes back. They're completely indifferent to her. This might be because they learned they had to be more independent or the relationship is just not as close. Then we have the anxious babies. These anxious babies get upset when the mom leaves, but not just upset, they're distressed. They're crying so hard, they're vomiting, they're panicking. And when the mom comes back, they don't calm down right away. In fact, they tend to be angry and hostile, and more like, how could you leave me sort of attitude. Now we realize there might be some other infants that can't quite get classified in those three types, and they tend to be called disorganized, and that we can't really uh, put them in one of the categories or not. Now, it might be hard for you to think back and think about your own attachment when you're an infant, and that's okay, because your infant attachment likely plays a role in your relationships today that we'll talk about as we continue. And the final segment in infant development is cognitive development. This is a really fascinating time, and it, what Piaget called this was the sensory motor stage. And it was sensory motor because we use our motor development and our sensations to experiment and understand cause and effect with the world. If you kick your crib and your mobile spins, you might realize those are correlated and you might continue to kick the crib to get the mobile to spin more and start to develop that correlation or that pattern. If you're in a high chair and you drop food over the edge and you see it drop and make a splat on the floor, you might do that repetitively just to keep trying it out and getting used to it. It can be really irritating for caregivers, but this is important. This is a really important way for infants to understand how their world works. Another thing that happens here is they become um, aware of imitation. Babies begin to imitate as reflex early on, where if an, if an adult sticks their tongue out, the infant will stick their tongue out. If an adult grimaces, the infant will grimace. If an adult smiles, the infant will smile. But eventually that reflex goes away and it comes back voluntarily. And the ability to imitate voluntarily is a really advanced cognitive skill. 
And finally, we're going to talk about object permanence. This is the idea that when you can't see an object or it's not immediately in your vision, you know it exists. Babies don't have this right away. So when a caregiver leaves or a ball rolls behind curtains, they think it no longer exists and they won't look for it. But eventually they have object permanence and if we roll a ball behind some curtains, babies' eyes will track behind the curtains and, and anticipate when it's going to leave and at a certain velocity. Babies are born to be scientists, so they understand when the principles of physics and, and science are violated and a ball rolls when it comes out as a bigger ball or it leaves at a different velocity, and that allows us to test their object permanence. So there's a lot of stuff going on in infancy, and hopefully that kind of helps to explain a bit, but I think it's going to make a lot more sense as we move into the next stage, which is the biggest stage in developmental research, and that is childhood.